Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News where we discuss the events that will have taken place in our country over the past weeks. And as usual, I want to say it's happy, it, it's great rather, for me to be here with you once again. I want to begin by welcoming our viewers who are joining us on television in Region 5. Welcome once again to another program of issues in the news. To our viewers who are joining us on television in Region 6, welcome once again to another program of issues in the news. To our listeners and viewers who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome once again to another program of issues in the news. And last but not least, to our friends and followers on Facebook who are joining us on this live stream across Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and as far as Australia, welcome once again to another program of issues in the news. I want to invite you, as I normally would do, to press that share button on that computer, press the share button on your phone, press the share button on your device, so that as many of your friends and many of your followers as possible can join us in this important discourse. Again, please press that share button, that share modicum on your phone, on your computer, on your device, so that the widest possible audience can be invited to join us in tonight's discussion. And I already have a few hundreds of persons online joining us from Toronto, from Alaska, from Florida, of course right here in Georgetown, from uh, uh, right across the US, from New Jersey. Um, hundreds of you are already on the live stream. Thank you and welcome once again. I want to begin by apologizing for the many weeks that I have not been able to hold this program and that is or that was as a result of compelling duties of government and compelling duties of state that prohibited me from being with you for several weeks. But I am here nonetheless and we have a packed agenda for discussion. I want to also um, extend my sincerest gratitude and to do so on behalf of myself and my wife on the many, many, many congratulatory messages and best wishes that we would have received from you on the birth of our son um, over a week ago. The thunderous um, the thunderous congratulatory messages that still continue to flow in my inbox, in my WhatsApp messages, and, and of course on Facebook are indeed very moving and I want to thank you very much for your warm sentiments and your feelings of love and best wishes for us as a family and of course for the baby. The baby is well and so is the mother. So everything is fine on that front. There is so much for us to discuss, having regard to the fact that we have been, I have been off the air for a while. So it's difficult to choose one topic to begin with. But let's start with the incident involving Minister Nigel Daramlau, because as the principal legal advisor of the government of Guyana, I am expected to speak on this matter. So, like everyone else, I am observing what is going on, what is transpiring on the social media front, on the streets, in the protest lines, commentaries that are being made in the newspapers, and of course, the government's position. The government's position is that the law 
must be allowed to take its course. A serious allegation has been made against a minister of our government. That minister has been sent on administrative leave pending the investigation and eventual outcome of that investigation and advice that would have to be rendered by the independent office of the director of public prosecutions. That is the process outlined in our criminal justice statutes. That is the facility that every single citizen of this country is entitled to. And I am here to assure that that system will be scrupulously followed. Mr. Nigel Daramlal, he's a colleague of ours in the government, and he's also a citizen of Guyana. In both capacities, he's entitled to certain due processes. Those due processes as enshrined in our administrative protocols, in our legal statutes, in our criminal processes are being pursued and are being carried out. They will not be influenced one way or another by virtue of the fact that Mr. Daramlal is a minister or it would be compromised in any form or fashion because politicians would like a particular outcome. I am happy that the Child Protection Agency, a statutory body under the Child Protection Agency Act, has issued a statement. In that statement, they have said that the matter is being processed and has been processed in accordance with their standard operational procedures. The provisions of the Child Care Protection Agency Act and some protocols promulgated by the Caribbean Court of Justice in respect of sexual offenses. Those are the guiding documents and protocols and procedures that were activated and used in relation to this investigation and interrogation at the level of the child care protection agencies agency and they have issued a public statement to that effect they also said that that is the procedure that they have been using for the past few years they have employed an agency that is retained to conduct forensic interviews in those circumstances along with members of the Guyana Police Force. That protocol again has been invoked and scrupulously followed. The file was passed to the police as files are required to be treated and the police have examined the file and they have transmitted that file to the Director of Public Prosecutions for her input, or for the input of that office. And that is where the matter is at currently. And that is the procedure and process outlined by the law. I am happy also that the Director of Public Prosecutions have seen it fit to issue a statement in which the holder of that office has made it clear, as she is entitled to do and required to do, that she will not be influenced or intimidated 
in any form or fashion by any side in this matter, including those who are protesting and demanding a particular outcome from that office. The Director of Public Prosecutions correctly asserts that the office is urging the general public to desist from politicizing an alleged criminal offense. It is indeed one of national interest and therefore all statements and or evidence must be considered before legal advice is to be given to the Guyana police force. The DPP's office will continue to carry out its constitutional function in an impartial manner. This is a statement emanating from an independent constitutional office holder. I want to assure that the government is complying with all the standard operational procedure and the state apparatus is complying with all the standard operational procedure in this matter. And the government is not intervening. The government has no role to play. I see circulating in the public domain a contention that I, as Attorney General, has requested that anyone who wishes to speak to the child or the victim must come through me. First of all, I reject that contention absolutely. The Office of the Attorney General has distanced itself from this matter, from the inception. I heard Mr. Kemraj Ramjatan complaining that he has tried to make contact with me and I have not engaged him. That is true. I will not engage him. I will not be engaged in this matter. I am connected through government and through my political party membership with the person under investigation. It is improper for me to play any part, not that I have a part to play in any event. The Solicitor General of Guyana is offering legal advice to the Child Care Protection Agency as that office holder is entitled and duty bound to do. Not the Attorney General, the Solicitor General. The holder of that office is a gentleman by the name of Nigel Hawk. For the record, he's a professional as far as I am aware, and he was appointed under the previous administration. When our government took office, unlike Basil Williams, who dismissed the entire professional staff at the Attorney General Chambers, not a single professional staff at the Attorney General Chambers was dismissed when this government got into office. Not a single professional staff was dismissed when this government took office. Mr. Hawke is there up to now, and as Solicitor General, he is entitled and required to advise agencies of government and agencies of state as the law permits him to do. And Mr. Hawke has engaged the Child Care Protection Agency for legal guidance upon their request. The Attorney General, as I said, was not involved. I ask that the system be allowed to work. Those politicians who are prosecuting and persecuting their political agendas must desist from so doing. If they are serious 
in their advocacy for justice to prevail, then they must not interfere. What they are doing can be considered interference because they are openly canvassing for a particular outcome. Mr. Nigel Dharamlal, as a citizen, is accorded certain constitutional and legal safeguard, safeguards by the highest of our laws, the Constitution. He's accorded certain facilities. He's presumed innocent, like every other citizen of this country. And the investigative arm of the state must be allowed free from any form of pressure to conduct its investigatory role and functions. So those politicians who are deciding to mount the streets and protests and protest must understand that what they are interfering with is the system. I am not saying that one cannot protest, but you cannot protest while the process is ongoing, demanding a particular outcome, because you have already concluded and you have not seen the evidence. None of them, as far as I'm aware, have seen the file have seen the statements. In fact, I, there are conflicting statements that are out there that the investigators have to do their job in relation to. So, I thought that I would put those candid views out there and lawyers, politician lawyers, who are using this opportunity because they're lawyers, to score political points, that cheap tactic is easily discernible and it is reprehensible. Why Mr. Ramjatan wants to engage me, knowing full well of my relationship with Mr. Nigel Dharamlal? Mr. Ramjatan doesn't know better. And if it is, that Mr. Ramjatan is truly retained as he says he is and some wrong is being done in respect of the person whose interest apparently he says he's retained to protect. Well, is he that helpless as a lawyer? Is the law so ho hopeless that he has no remedy? It is a shallow and despicable attempt to politicize a serious criminal investigation. And that must be rejected out of hand in the interest of justice. If one is serious, then one must allow the criminal justice system to travel its path. In America, it takes months before investigations of this type are concluded. It takes weeks before legal advice are given. This incident has happened quite recently, comparatively. And from what is out there in the public domain, it has various dimensions. We in the government are interested in the rule of law prevailing. And that is what we have said from the inception. We leave it there.
So, while I was away, on June the 19th, the High Court dismissed the challenge filed by Christopher Jones and Norris Witter against the Natural Resource Fund Act. It's a case that was described in the press as the Mace case. Recall on that fateful day, I believe it was the 29th of December, 2022, 2021, sorry, the opposition parliamentarians decided rather than stay in their seat and voice their views as are required, as is required by the standing orders of the parliament, to the bill in defiance and in violation of numerous admonitions emanating from the speaker's chair, they decided to arrogate unto themselves the power to do what they think is necessary to demonstrate their opposition to the passage of the bill. And their demonstration of that opposition manifested itself in them descending into the well of the parliament, dancing, gyrating, singing, whining, blowing whistles, and behaving in the most vulgar and unruly fashion. And if, when that did not satisfy their thirst for vulgarity, they then grabbed the mace, the very mace that they went to court to say is the authority of the parliament. They grabbed that mace and broke it and assaulted members of the National Assembly, staff of the National Assembly, dragged a young man across the floor of the National Assembly, broke the mace in two. They went into the microphone system and they broke it up so that you, we couldn't hear, we couldn't use the microphone system. And if all of that was not a horrid episode that they would like the nation to forget in their own best political interest, they then chose the inexplicable path of going to the, litiga going to the high court by litigation to, one, keep it in the public domain, and two, to have a court of law pronounce upon their conduct. These are the moments that you have to question the reasoning capabilities of these people. Any sensible bunch of people would have decided, you know what? This was an erratic, unfortunate moment. This is something that we have to sweep under the carpet and let's hope that people forget it. Not this bunch. They, decide, they decided to keep it in the public domain, but worse, to have a court of law interrogate and pronounce upon it. Somewhere in the back of their sordid minds, they believe, I don't know what, by what machination of reasoning and logic, but they apparently convinced themselves that some judge is going to believe their ridiculous story. I tendered in evidence the entire proceedings which we have on video. So I didn't have to do much talking. Their images were there and of course they can't object that that is them. That is not them. Their images, the judge looked at, I didn't have to say much about what happened. I had to address the judge on the law. But in relation to what happened 
the court had no difficulty in deciphering what the facts were and what actually transpired on that fateful night. It was in permanent recorded form for the judge to look at. And they knew that from the inception. Yet, they made a strategic and thought out decision to proceed to litigate something as ridiculous as that. Again, I ask you, I ask you to draw your own conclusion regarding the mental makeup of this bunch of people. You don't have to tell me what your conclusions are. Just interrogate it and do some self-examination or some examination of that and draw your own inferences. I will not interfere with that cognitive process of yours. Another important ruling that has been delivered by another High Court judge is a ruling that allows the Attorney General to join legal proceedings filed challenging the environmental permit granted in respect of the gas to energy project. There is a new trend that is going on in Guyana, which hopefully we have to resolve at the level of the court, at the level of the judiciary. So public spirited citizens, and that's how they describe themselves, are challenging the government's actions in the oil and gas sector and the state's actions in the oil and gas sector on the pretext that they are acting in the public's interest. And they are filing what is in law called public interest litigation. Public interest litigation is a commendable concept. It owes its origin in the United States of America but it was made popular in the Commonwealth through the former Chief Justice of India, Bhagwati. Chief Justice Bhagwati was confronted with the greatest mass of indigent people who can't afford to access the justice system in India, but who need the justice system more than any other segment of the population. But the current, the then existing laws and rules of court prevented them from being represented by anyone else. At that time, you had a strict law of local standi, which means that you had to actually suffer the wrong yourself before you can get standing to complain in the court. And Justice Bhagwati recognized that as one of the singular most formidable obstruction to poor people accessing the justice system. And he virtually abolished the rule of local standi in India. And he relaxed the rules in relation to procedures in relation to how to approach the court to allow, first of all, persons to file cases in the public's interest on behalf of those who can't afford to file in their own behalf. And to do so, not necessarily through a lawyer, but through lay persons who are there for the rules the technical rules of procedure were relaxed to accommodate this type of litigation. And out of that was born in the Commonwealth public interest litigation, which we have embraced in Guyana and is something that I support. However, the other end of the litigation 
always is the authorized, legally recognized defender and guardian of the public's interest. And the legal guardian and protector and defender of the public's interest is always the Attorney General under the British system. So when Justice Bhagwati conceived and designed that system of public interest litigation, the Attorney General of India or of that particular state, because India is a union, the Union of India, governed by different states with different peculiar rules, statutes, uh, etc. The Attorney General of that locality or the person holding that post was always named. That's how the concept evolved. In Guyana, a, de a, a strange development is taking place where the Attorney General is left out and these public interest and public spirited citizens, public interest driven and public spirited citizens are filing these cases, excluding the Attorney General, and the Attorney General now has to fight to get into the case. In litigation, that he is lawfully a party and ought to have been from the beginning. Those issues are currently before the Court of Appeal in the unlimited guarantee ruling. And hopefully, we will have some clarity soon. Two citizens, whoever they are, Radzik, or whether they are White and Collins, or whether they are Jack and Jill, cannot determine what they the public interest is of any country. The determinant of the public interest in any given democracy is the executive government of the day. The Constitution of Guyana appoints the Attorney General as the principal legal advisor of the government. If the Constitution is violated, or any constitutional ethos is violated, it is the Attorney General who is the statutory respondent on behalf of the state. These are cardinal principles of a democratic constitutional democracy. So I hope that we will get some clarity from the judiciary on these matters where they are all important and I'm not objecting to a citizen who has nothing to do with the oil and gas sector but that citizen is conferred with the locus standi to institute. The proceedings can have devastating impact on the state, upon the government of the day, upon the government's budgetary projection upon the very economy of the country. It can have an impact on government's contractual obligations. It can have an impact on the public's interest because the public interest is intricately tied to a government's developmental agenda. And the government and the government's legal advisor is excluded. That is a serious state of affairs. And hopefully we get clarity from it, from the judiciary, shortly. The Caribbean Court of Justice did its second sojourn in Guyana recently. It is regrettable that it took nearly a decade and a half for them to revisit, having regard to the last time they were here. And I've expressed that view to the judges when we had an engagement during their visit here. 
we welcome the Caribbean Court of Justice to sit with greater regularity in Guyana. After all, it's our apex court. So they sat and they heard many matters, including a matter involving sexual assault. And they made it very, very clear that neither the victim's identity nor the accuser's identity ought to be made public. In fact, they changed the name of the case in order to protect the identity of these persons, both the victim and the accuser. And here it is in this current investigation you have those who are pretending or purporting to represent the victim to represent the victim's interest not only disclosing her identity but disclosing who her parents are or whereabouts or address and discussing the case itself and they are doing the same in relation to the accused persons. Matters that our highest court, right here in Guyana, during the course of last week, pronounced against. The lawyers who are masquerading in the streets as protagonizing to protect the interest of the child. But are doing exactly that will not comment. They will not comment on those things. And those things show you whose interest really they are canvassing. Is it the interest of justice? Is it the interest of the victim? Or is it they are prosecuting and persecuting a political cause and agenda because it involves a politician who is on the opposing side of the political divide. You draw the inferences. I am putting the facts out there. But during the, their stint in Guyana, the CCJ held a discussion forum in which they lamented about the state of the criminal justice system in Guyana as well as the rest of the Caribbean. Recently, just over a month or so ago, in Trinidad and Tobago, the entire CARICOM heads of government, attorneys general, and other important personnel met at the Hyatt Regency in Port of Spain, Trinidad to engage on this very issue, the state of the criminal justice system. And the consensual view at that conference and at the discussion here in Guyana is that we have to reform the criminal justice system. And our government is prepared to play its part. Even before these public pronouncements were made, our government is on record offering critical remarks in relation to the functioning of our criminal justice system. I have been accused of attacking, for want of a better word. Well, attacking was the word used, the adjective used. A sitting magistrate, because I offered my critical views on a particular ruling. Views by which I stand to up to now. But I am happy that the 
apex court is speaking on this matter. We are, we are doing massive reforms at the legislative level. But much more than that is obviously required. As the CCJ forum disclosed. Of course, we have to work in tandem with the judiciary to correct the system because we are not interested in a system skewed. We are interested in a system efficient and competent that will deliver justice in accordance with law. That's all that we ask. And that's what we are prepared to partner with the judiciary in ensuring established here. We have begun the process, as I said, in our legislative agenda. And we are working, we have already delivered a number of laws from 2020 to now, all designed to impact positively upon our justice system, in particular, our criminal justice system. Now we have many more in the pipeline. Only today, I issued a press statement in which I disclosed a copy of the plea bargaining bill that will be taken to Parliament. That mechanism was highlighted as one of the means by which we can bring greater speed to the system and to the legal, criminal legal process. We can reduce the backlog. We can save a lot of resources while at the same time maintaining an acceptable and just and fair and legal regime of sanctions and penalties to be, to be imposed when criminal wrongs are committed. This system has worked throughout the Caribbean. It has worked in the United States. It has worked in the Commonwealth. We have reviewed the examples which exist in the Caribbean and fashioned our bill in accordance with what exists and added more advanced concepts and processes to it to make it the most modern expression of the law in this region. Readers or listeners will recall that over a decade ago, we had passed a law like this, but it had some inherent functional deficiencies and it never really achieved the purpose that it was intended to achieve. The deficiencies have been identified and corrected. This bill allows, even before charge, a charge is instituted, and after charge is instituted, and without a guilty verdict is agreed upon, it allows the prosecution and the defense to sit at a table and work out an acceptable arrangement and that is required in this modern age we have completed a draft sorry this bill that I'm speaking about has received the input from a consultative exercise in which the director of public prosecution was engaged the police force was engaged the judiciary was engaged, the practicing bar was engaged, the police legal advisor was engaged, 
and the Guyana Law Reform Commission was engaged. This bill is now ready for Parliament. Well, taken to, we have to take it to Cabinet and then Parliament. We also have sentencing guidelines. We have a first draft of them, and they are to receive an input from the judiciary, and then they are ready for promulgation. The judiciary is an important stakeholder as the judiciary will have to execute the guidelines or comply with the guidelines. So their input is fundamental. That should address, or those guidelines should address the inconsistent sentencing patterns that members of the public have complained against on the social media, in the traditional media, and even in their public discourses. These are all important reforms taking place in the criminal justice system. Only today, I have dispatched a letter to the Honorable Chancellor of the Judiciary conveying to the Honorable Chancellor the complaints which I have received in my public consultations with various stakeholders in relation to the stagnant jury pool which exists in Guyana. The jury pool in Guyana has not been reviewed in a number of years, perhaps decades. So the complaint is that the jury pool is quite narrow, firstly, that many of the companies that form part of that pool whose employees are drawn to sit on juries, those companies are no longer existing or functioning. That's the first complaint. Secondly, there are hundreds of new companies that have entered the arena whose employees are not part or who are not part of that pool so their employees do not get an opportunity to discharge this important civic responsibility. Thirdly, because of its stagnation, the question arises whether the pool from which the juries are drawn reflect Guyana's cur current realities. The principle upon which the jury system is predicated is the trial by, by the accused by a jury of his peers. That's a fundamental principle, that you must be tried by your peers. Does the jury system, does the jury pool from which these juries are drawn, do they now accurately represent the peers of the accused person? This pool having not been revamped or reviewed in decades. So, I have conveyed those concerns to the Honorable Chancellor and hopefully we can get some action. I hope I'm not wrong, but this is the complaint which we have received. I recall distinctly meeting with the gender, the Women and Gender, gender, equal, gender and Equality Commission, and that was one of their fundamental concerns which they raised, and they called to follow up 
on that concern. The President has announced that a commission of inquiry will be established to inquire into the horrendous Madhya Dorms fire. And I have been assigned the responsibility to assist with the crafting of the terms of reference and the establishment of the commission. And following up on what the president has disclosed, work has begun on both the terms of reference as well as constituting the commission and finding the physical seat of the commission or where the commission will sit. All of that are work in progress. And hopefully, we will have that up and running very shortly. Someone has asked a question about the abolition of preliminary inquiries bill. That bill is completed as well, and I will issue a press statement in relation to this bill. This bill is currently the subject of consultation with the bar, the DPP, the judiciary, and the other, the other stakeholders. So that bill will soon be ready. And that, again, is another bill that will have a fundamental impact upon the administration of criminal justice. This bill is intended to abolish preliminary inquiries. So the long backlog which currently exists in the system and which to do preliminary inquiry before a person is committed to stand trial and the resultant delays which flow therefrom and the resultant long period of remands which that delay causes will all be addressed in this new bill. As I said, the Caribbean has moved in this direction and we are following suit. I have seen the opposition, well, first of all, the petroleum, the petroleum activities bill has been sent out by the Ministry of Natural Resources and interested persons and organizations and important stakeholders have been invited to provide their input on that platform, the platform that sent the bill out. And I, I suppose hard copies can be submitted to hard copies of inputs, I suppose, can also be submitted at that ministry. I see the office of the leader of the opposition has issued a press statement in which they have offered their criticisms and I suppose inter uh, recommendations in relation to that bill. I hope that they have complied with the request of the Natural Resource Ministry, that is to say, to submit their input at that forum or at that platform so that it will be taken on board 
when the, the products of the consultation exercise is being examined to do the final touches, when we are doing the final touches of the bill. When this process is completed, then the bill will come to the Attorney General Chambers, and then I prefer to make my comments. I'm not going to offer comments now. Um, the bill is out there, that's the government's proposal, and we are ready to receive all criticisms, all commentaries, all recommendations, all suggested amendments, and internally we will examine them, and decisions will be made which, will, which to adopt and which not to adopt. And that's how the process is. We don't guarantee anyone that we will accept their proposals, neither do we say that we are not going to accept. The process, the government has some policy directives, the government has a vision, the government campaigned on a particular structure for this bill, as we did in relation to the local content bill, as we did in relation to the natural resource fund bill. If one goes to our manifesto, one will see elements of these bills uh, set out in our manifesto. And that's the contract and compact which we have with the people. And they elected us, and we are bound to implement that which we promise. Of course, we are not monolithic and we are not inflexible. And once a recommendation helps our policy directives, of course we'll adopt it. If we believe that it is inimical to what we conceive the bill should contain or the bill should propose, then we will ignore it. And we will give the justification for our decision. We remain open, however, in the process. So, someone wrote and asked that I comment, and those are my comments at this point in time. Um, a question is asked also in relation to the Companies Act. The Companies Act is undergoing a review the Law Reform Commission has been doing some work on it. We have received inputs from the private sector. We have received inputs from the Association of Chartered Accountants. And we have received inputs, I believe, from the practicing bar in relation to um, amendments that are being suggested or proposed for the Companies Act. Those proposals are being collated and studied and work is being done in reducing them or crystallizing them into amendment proposals which will be later, which will be considered and, and refined and later discussed. So, yes, the answer to that question is yes. So, comrades and ladies and gentlemen, this is where I have to say that we have come to the end of this one hour. We have had a packed program. I've dealt with a number of issues, number of important issues, I think, and I hope that I have answered some of your concerns and some of the issues that you would like me to have addressed. I didn't get much of an opportunity to read your comments because I was speaking um, continuously. But please continue to engage me. Still, you can still share this program even after the live feed is ended so that more people can read it, more people can see it rather, more people can listen to it. The more people listen to it, the more encouraged I am to, to, to continue to do the program. But most importantly, the message of the program gets out. I've said over and over again that while I have my obvious political bias, which I am entitled to have, I try to do some type of knowledge sharing on this program. I try to explain intricate 
um, and complex issues of law in particular, because that's my training, the constitution, the legal system, the legal processes, so that you, the layman, can understand how government functions and how the legal system works. And I hope that I, I, I am gaining some ground in that regard. So that is why I want, I don't want all this effort to be wasted. I want the widest possible audience so that we can, look, the more educated we are, the more aware we are of these processes and these systems, the more evolved we will become as a people and as a society. The quicker we will advance as a country and the better we will become as individuals and human beings. Knowledge is power. And I attempt with all my deficiencies to try to impart whatever learning I have in these programs. And that's why more than anything else, I would like them to be disseminated far and wide. I want to thank you very much. I hope to be with you next week. Until I see you again, have a great evening and enjoy the rest of the week. Stay safe and I will hook up with you next week as we continue this discourse. Thank you.